First of all, thank you to the inertia, Zach. I really, uh, I just have an immense amount of respect for you. Ever since you were an intern at uh, Surfer Magazine and I met you at Surfer Pole and I was like, this kid's turned on in a weird way that I'm not used to. I think he might end up doing some shit. Um, and it's, uh, it's an honor. I can't believe that I'm sitting on this stage with you who I had a poster of on my wall when I first moved to California and first started surfing just because I just wanted to be as strong as you one day. Um, but I didn't know what that, that strength truly meant. I'm gonna read something um, that a little known surfer who's starting to make, he has some potential to make some noise uh, said about you today. I asked him um, to describe you. And he said, a transformed, enlightened, caring individual who escaped the pitfalls of stardom and fleeting moments for a deep and meaningful connection to the world he loves. Yeah. <laughs> that was from the GOAT, Mr. Kelly Slater. Thanks, Kelly. Um, it's interesting that we're having this conversation today. Let's just be frank. We are in a weird ass time uh, in this country. And there's this conversation happening, this idea that people with incredible natural ability and superhuman technique at the sports that they love should only shut up and play the sports that we clap for them to participate in. And I can't help but feel a mirroring in your story to where we sit at in America today, especially what we see going on with the NFL protests. And I thought to myself when I was watching this movie, if Twitter and Instagram and Facebook had existed, oh my God. when you made this choice <laughs> in 1985, Boom. what do you think it would have been? I can't imagine, to be honest. Um, it was enough uh, to sort of make that decision and to do it. And then sort of, um, the one thing that's not highlighted in that story and what, what happened really for me was kind of after the making the decision and um, is what happened to me when I sort of faced my own country and what happens in my own country and the, and the sort of backwash from that decision for another country's situation. Um, so I can't, I can't imagine, you know, the, the kind of on flow of having all that information sort of double and triple and double and triple itself and exponentially just pop all at once. Uh, it might have been uh, too overwhelming for me. At that time, I was only 24 years of age. So um, it was, you know, now, now I'm thinking about it. It's, yeah, it's kind of overwhelming thinking of that. W what was it about South Africa that caused you to feel in this manner to the point where you couldn't no longer ignore yourself for the sake of any other kind of benefits? Well, I just think it, it was, you know, I guess it's a combination of life, you know, living, um, you know, I came from a home where there was no such thing as kind of that kind of judgment um, or those kind of actions towards another human being. So I'm lucky to live in that environment when my brain was mapped in that, fa that fashion. Um, uh, I also had a fair amount of loss early in life and I lost my mother when I was seven so I was very sensitive um, by nature and I think as we grow older and, and you know um, and I turn into this athlete you know and when you become an athlete and, and uh, I think also all those sensitivities are brought to the surface because you're working so hard to be good at something and it's taking all your physical and mental effort and then all of a sudden you become more sensitive to the world around me, you know. I just became a lot more sensitive to the world around me. Uh, and, you know, I did, s I did surf in South Africa and go there and travel there from 1981 uh, till 1984. So that's, you know, four years of, of going there to compete and get this information in me that, wow, like, 
you know, um, to get to that point to become a two-time world champion, to get platformed. To, well, I didn't even know talk about platforms back then uh, the way we do now, but it was uh, set the stage for me to, uh, you know, make that decision. But what was going on in those visits was was a kind of certain disbelief within me, something deep down inside. Like it came across in the, it beautifully, Zach um, put that together, showed me exactly what it was like back then, and that was, and like I am today, uh, it was deeply disturbing, some of the kinds of behaviour towards one from one human being to the next, or one human being to the other, just solely uh, through the colour of the skin. It, it just, for me, didn't make any sense whatsoever. It, it doesn't make any sense. You know, we're sitting here, look, what, you know, what is going on in this place for people to be behave so cruelly to work towards each other? Um, and it wasn't so much... And it set up a, a, a wild kind of feeling in the air, to be honest, um, something that was probably... Um, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was generations old. It was, it, you could feel it within every movement of um, particularly the white, uh, you know, the, the... I was talking about someone um, that I stayed with uh, in that movie that when we were going out, you know, going down to the surf really early in the morning and, and the help was walking back up to the big apartments to, to help... <laughs> help do their washing and cleaning and all the stuff, you know? And uh, and how he was swerving kind of to, you know, that kind of behaviour blew me away. Like I was, you know, it brought it right back. And um, and that was a really, it was a, you know, that happened morning after morning when we were going surfing. I felt incredibly powerless to that um, at those times. And also there was one particular time, I'll never forget this one, that has been coming up for me, in the lead up to coming here to talk about this was uh, there's a Barclays Bank in the centre of Durban where I used to go and cash my travellers checks. Back then there was, you know, travellers checks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, and I walking into the bank and uh, and I found myself there was this there was this African kid. Um, he had something wrong with his leg and his arm. And he was on the step over here to the right. I'll never forget it. And as I was walking up, I gave him a couple of rand, you know, because he's begging. You know, he's got nothing else going on. He's just trying to get somewhere. Um, mate, he's trying to feed himself. He was... Anyway, um, and that, that was definitely a situation where I felt like I'd give something. And, uh, and I was all of a sudden turned around and I heard this, Oh, shame. Look at the little gaffer boy. You know? And there's this, I turned around and I saw and all of a sudden I was sandwiched between this lady dripping with gold walking into the bank and uh, not really looking but just walking. And I kind of, I go back to that moment, I felt like I was really in between two incredible worlds, <laughs> like really sandwiched. And, and it's still, that was the attitude that had to be kind of looked at. <laughs> you know, uh, from my point of view, I... Um, I couldn't support it. And for clarity, the word kafir would translate to nigger. And that was basically what she said fleetingly about that boy that you were dealing with. Yeah, that's it. And, um, and that's pretty clear in my memory. <laughs> Very clear in my memory. My father was a political exile. He fled South Africa in 1959 because of apartheid. And he had to leave because he was either going to be thrown in jail or killed because he was an activist and he was making music with white musicians. And he didn't have a home for 30 years to continue to fight for apartheid. So if my dad wouldn't have left South Africa, I never would have ended up in California. I never would have ended up discovering surfing. And if it wasn't for that fight, I wouldn't be sitting here with you on this stage. <laughs> wow. And, um, awesome. you know, to watch that movie, 
uh, and to sit here with you, you know, as I'm sitting here in his memory, I lost him six or seven months ago. It's just, uh, it's incredibly powerful, the choice um, that you made. My dad would, would just, I could see him right now being like, man that Tommy <laughs> he's what a what a guy man yeah it's a thank real you. one man. it's a real yeah. one thank you what was it what was it like amongst your peers in 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 that immediate moment because that shit must have been weird <laughs> Shit was pretty weird. Um, uh, it well, there was some support, you know. Uh, you know, Tom Curran supported it. Uh, Martin Potter supported it. Gary Elkton supported it. Uh, there was some other um, kind of mishaps, I guess, along the way. For me, you know, being 24, being a young Australian male, particularly, I wasn't great at communication. Uh, I didn't understand how to vocalise what I was going to do before it. You know, I was like, well. You know, like, like that. <laughs> so you didn't tell the ASP or your sponsor beforehand? I didn't beforehand. tell anyone, uh, you know, that I really needed to tell, and I really am very, very sorry to, sh you know, I feel like I really need to make amends with Sean Thompson around that. Um, he's a, he was my surfing hero, um, and at that time he was sponsoring me through Instinct Clothing. And I really, if I was a little more mature about myself and how I was carrying myself, I would have, you know, gone and talked to them really, in, in especially Sean directly. Uh, you know, so I'm really sorry about that and how that may have affected Sean. Uh, still today, you know, um, and but nevertheless, uh, I felt um, that because it was such a surprise when I did it, it threw people out and, and you know, I wouldn't recommend sort of doing it the way I did it. Uh, I'd definitely call upon people and support and actually do it right and do, do the steady kind of way to it. But... That wasn't my style, I guess, uh, back then. Let me ask you this, though. You, first of all, you lost your sponsorship from Instinct Clothing as a real result yeah, of this. that's it. Which is, and you had just become world champion. For the second time, yeah, so. Right, it was yeah. <laughs> okay, I just won my second world championship. Let me set some shit on fire. Boom. But <laughs> I, would, I would say that given the response of Ian Cairns, the ASP, the surf community, the media in general, do you think that you, there would have been a different outcome, that they would have been like, well, sure, Tom, let us help you make this crazy protest right now and suddenly be political. We've got your back. Well, I think that's, that, that was what was happening with surfing. They didn't feel that, that they were really a part of the world in a way. Um, I think in... You know, we were trying to be a professional sport. We are trying to be profession professional athletes. I particularly was trying to follow the lead of people like Sean Thompson, Mark Richards and, and Robert Bartholomew and, 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 and Dane Kelloa and all these guys. I'd, I was looking to be a professional athlete, you know, and actually bring it, uh, you know, train, do all these things, you know, you know study how to be a professional in, in every way, shape or form. Um, and uh, you know, communication was one thing was lacking. But as far as my whole application to the sport, and but the ASP um, and and that organisation really was just they just sent them into shock. They gone, oh my god, what is he saying? You know, and they couldn't get the fact that you know they're clinging on to any support they could with every event that they could have on tour, which meant include South Africa no matter what. Um, and obviously, um, it came, you know, apartheid didn't come into that uh, for them. Mm. Which was interesting because at that time, in every other sport, athletes that did go to South Africa mm. took heat for it. Yes. Surfing was yeah. the only sport where at the time you got heat for choosing not <laughs> to go. Like, in the, as, as far as the landscape was, co was concerned. But what was interesting is that first it was you, and then next year, Martin Potter... Tom Curran, mm. and by 1989, 25 of the 30 surfers on tour decided not to compete in South Africa. Brilliant. So good. <laughs> See, I think um, I'm deeply moved by, um, you know, people like 
Mahatma Gandhi and um, people who just um, do things by example, who do things in a in a in a, um, a peaceful way, who try to join, come to the middle road, uh, and I think that by just by working through, you know, doing the action, creating attraction in that way, uh, we all start to move in good ways, really good ways. Mm. What was it like when you found out that Nelson Mandela wanted to talk to you after he got out of jail? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you how that came about. I've got a friend, uh, who's uh, um, actually white South African, who moved to Australia, and he, uh, he, was in, he was running the Nelson Mandela Foundation, actually, in Australia, and gaining support and so on. And um, anyway, he told me, this is in 2000, and this is some years after N Mandela had, uh, had taken over the, the leadership of South Africa, and uh, he was well on his way. He was doing speaking uh, engagements around the world. And uh, he came to Sydney. He said, oh, look, he's coming to sit. And, you know, Nelson Mandela's coming to, to speak in Sydney. Would you like to come and, you know, sit, sit at one of the tables and, and listen? I said, for sure. Put me on. I'm there. Uh, you know, um, and, you know, Bob Hawke, the, the Prime Minister, was in, in uh, Parliament there. Was, he was the Prime Minister when I made my decision. He supported me. Uh, was going to the dinner as well, and we heard, we listened to Nelson Mandela speak. It was beautiful. It was, you know, he held the space incredibly, in, in an amazing aura. Um, very powerful person to be in the room with. Uh, just through his own sacrifice, you can feel it. Like, it actually, you can feel it coming off him. <laughs> so, uh, it's hard to explain from this point, but um, when someone does that sort of thing, it's, yeah, it's, it's incredible. Um, from a human point of view, it was very powerful. And I, uh, right after the dinner had finished, he stopped speaking, he was up on stage. Uh, Bob Hawke came over, because I was a little bit stunned, you know, I was like, you know, I was, I was stunned. I didn't really sort of move to go and, oh, I better meet him. But Bob Hawke came over and go, well, you've got to meet him, you know? And he, he's a real Australian, Bob Hawke's like, yeah, you've got to come over and speak to him, you know? Come on, I'll introduce you to him. <laughs> anyway, Bob, took me over there and uh, over to the stage, in the side of the stage, and we had a little three-way uh, conversation. And it was just beautiful. And it was really to that point, um, I kind of held on really tightly to the decision I made and, and some complexities in the back there still sitting there about, you know, the people that I disturbed and, and so on. I don't know why, but this sort of stuff clings onto me. I cling onto it, I should say. And the one thing that... Nelson turned to me after Bob told him all about my story and what I'd done and so on like that and in a beautiful, eloquent way. Bob Hawke was a very intelligent man, knew how to, knew how to talk and, and tell the story. And Nelson Mandela turned around to me and, and shook my hand and said, thank you, I needed all the support I could get at that time I was in Robben Island. And when he did that, I, right now I can feel it. Because um, I did... <laughs> It, um, it was um, the part of my human um, and the reason why I made the decision. It wasn't really for him. It was for the whole of humanity. So when he... But the way he said it and with his way and, and it just... Um, it hit a really strong chord. It relaxed me. All from my whole body relaxed. <laughs> and I, I don't know what that was, to be honest, but it was a, um, a really nice feeling. Um, the support, yeah. Which is why I, I say to you, Tom Carroll, with all due respect, you don't look back and feel like you should have done anything different. Because if you had done it in any other way, it wouldn't have happened and they wouldn't have listened. And you put yourself, you made a choice to have what you do and who you were be separate. And you decided to stand up and say, this is who I am, and I can't hide behind what I do. And there are so few people in that position, especially today, that are literally 
willing to risk it all to say what needs to be said for others. So let that shit go, man. It's gone. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks, Sal. If in, let's fast forward to today, the landscape of what uh, professional athletes and professional surfing especially uh, looks like. These athletes have very interesting deals now that are so much wrapped around the public image which transfers on to these rectangles that everyone carries around in their pockets and when they see something that I don't like that. I don't like how that makes me feel, how that person feels. It makes me uncomfortable. Ah! And people start screaming and tell, I used to respect you, and now that I know that this is how you think, I can't be a fan of you, etc., etc. I'm speaking from example, trust me. Um, that for a lot of these kids, they are not willing or don't know how to take the chance to stand up and maybe speak for the things that they want to. And we, as a community with surfing, are very, very content to keep our heads in the sand because we live in this beautiful utopia of Stoke. And don't ruin the Stoke, bro, with that shit that's going on in the rest of the world because that's not us. If you could give any sort of advice or, or mentorship, um, or if you were in that position today, um, what, what would you tell these, 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 these athletes, these, these, these kids today? Um, listen to your voice, your deep voice, you know? Just get back down, maybe drop the phone a little bit. Uh, you know, and that's a huge ask. I know it's, I get asked to drop the phone all the time by my partner. Uh, and it's tricky. We, we are caught in the rectangle. Um, and it'd be a really bizarre view if you went back 20 years and you looked at what people are doing now um, with them. But for the young surfer today, those young athletes, uh, listen, try to get down to that deeper, um, the conscience, you know, the, the conscience that we try to snuff out, um, that flicker, that flame, that, um, that says something and you go, oh no, you know, not that flicker again. Because uh, it's going to keep coming up. It doesn't go away. Something in us is just not going to go away until we act on it. So try to get back to that conscience. Uh, it's alive. It's inside you. It's connected to a power that's way bigger than us. So get to that conscience and let it, let it burn. Let it, f let it f fire up and listen to it. Share it with someone you trust and get the knowledge going, get the action going. On, on that note, um, all I can say is uh, thank you, man. Thank you from, uh, from the bottom of my heart. Thank <laughs> you so much for being you, you know, I thought you were the shit when you did that turn it pipe, but <laughs> <laughs> this is something else entirely. And uh, oh, yeah. it, uh, it lives on forever. And this is a story as I believe that in, in, in the annals of history, when we talk about all the legendary moments, you know, whether it's Greg Knoll, the day that he walked away, or all of the, the big massive moments, this is a moment that should be held up with the biggest within the history of our tradition and of this lifestyle. And I am just proud to know you and proud to stand on this stage. And on behalf of everybody here and, and the entire world, thank you, Tom Carroll. Oh, I really appreciate it.